Hello friends, welcome to our YouTube channel Trading Ninja. If you are not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Hey, hello. <laughs> Yeah, good morning. <laughs> and also, too, how many people came from the West Coast or, or in that in the West Coast time zone? Yeah, it was like the, 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 the wise trade people picked me up at 6.30 in the morning, which was 4.30 in the morning for me. So, so when I say that, you know, when I say this, we're here for you and to ignore the cameras, ignore the environment, I really mean that. But at the same time, I want you guys to help me a little bit, okay? <laughs> it might take me a little bit, you know, it might take me a little bit to get going because I'm not used to doing presentations at, you know, 6.30 in the morning, my time, or 7 o'clock in the morning, my time. But anyway, what, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go through the process of learning how to think like a professional trader. Why would we want to learn how to think like a professional? Anybody got any ideas? What's that? Make some money. Make some money. But you don't have to think like a professional to make money, do you? What does it even imply? What does it imply to, to think like a professional trader? I mean, let me ask you this. How many, you guys have, I don't know what your, what your trading experience has been in terms of the number of years you've been at it, or it kind of give me an idea of the, of, of the demographics here of the audience. I mean, how many people have been trading for more than two or three years? Most everybody? Uh, then, then, less than, then less than two years? Kind of new people? Oh, okay, so we've got about half and half. What would it mean to you guys to say, well, let's think like a professional trader? What's that? Not thinking like an amateur. Okay, that's good. But what are the implications of the difference between a professional and an amateur? Right, consistency. Consistency. There you go. You see you're at my Houston workshop, right? <laughs> yeah, consistency. Exactly. In other words, what, what that would imply is that, is that if, I'm a, if I'm a professional trader, in other words, if I've aspired to be a professional, it, 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 one of the implications would be that, that I can make consistent money because if I'm trading in the mode of a professional, I could be a hedge fund manager, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a professional hedger working for trading companies, or just having a full-time job as a trader where my income, my sole income, is derived as a trader. And to be in that kind of a position or to be in a position where other people are going to give you their money or, or give you their assets to be able to, you know, uh, uh, make money for them, it would certainly imply that you can make consistent money. That there is a way for you to, let's say, create an equity curve that looks, you know, something like this. Isn't that right? Are you going to give your money to somebody with an equity curve that looks like that? No. I'm not saying that people don't do it, and I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. But I'm saying that if I've aspired to be a professional trader, it means that I must have learned something that's different than the people who can't do this. There must be something about, about the way that I approach trading that allows me to do that. And believe me, there is. There's a lot. What's that? Cool. Yeah, cool. Basically, uh, and, and I don't know if, how many people in, in the room have... Uh, have either read Trading in the Zone or, or The Disciplined Trader? We've got a few people. So, so probably, there, so there's actually most of the people in the group are, aren't familiar, maybe even with me or my background at all. True or not? Yes or no? See, no, right? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit, uh, and I'll, I'll give you more later on, but uh, I started trading back in 1978. And... Uh, the first trade that I made, I, I, the first trade I made was in potato futures at the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which they don't even trade potato futures anymore. Why I pick potato futures, I have no idea. 
Uh, I think that's probably what my broker said I should be trading. Maybe he said that there was, you know, there was, there was an opportunity in potato futures. But anyway, I made money. And of course, you know, just like most people who make money, their, their first trade or their second trade, it's, it's about as easy as one could imagine. And therefore, you think to yourself, oh, my God, why didn't I learn about this a long time ago? It sound, I mean, that sounds kind of familiar, right, in terms of a thought process. And uh, I went from trading potatoes to trading gold to trading silver. And uh, my, I'd say my trading experience back then was probably typical even to what it is today with most people, although you have to keep in mind that the technology that we had back then wasn't anything, anything like what you have available to you right now today. It still boggles my mind when I think about the way we had to trade 25 years ago, or almost 30 years ago, compared to what's available right now. I mean, I've never, I've always been attracted more to trading commodities than stocks. As a matter of fact, I've never even traded stocks. I've always traded commodities and options. And, and it's just, and I've never really, never really had the um, desire to trade on the floor, the exchange. Uh, although I lived in Chicago for uh, 20 years, uh, it just, it never really appealed to me. I don't know how many people are familiar with the floor or the, or the, or the trading pits, but I just thought it was an extremely harsh environment and, and not something that, you know, not something that just, like I said, it appealed to me. But the, the kind of trading platforms that you guys have available to you today really, truly approximate what it would be like to have a seat at the, at the Chicago Board of Trade or Chicago Mercantile Exchange and, and to trade at that level. You have instantaneous execution. And, and, and it's like you, can, it, like you can change your mind and not feel humiliated or, or, or like, you know, there's something wrong with you. You can put it in order. You can cancel it. Back, you know, before, before the advent of electronic trading platforms, we used to have to call a broker. Now, you think about the time you made a decision to put on a trade. You think about the time that it takes, one, to dial the phone, for someone to pick the phone up, you know, how many times it has to ring, and then he gets on the other end of the line, you know, you got your broker, and then you give your broker your order, and then you've got to deal with the fact that does your broker really approve of your order? In other words, my, what I mean by approve is that, well, see, I'm, you know, I, I want to buy, you know, I want to buy three gold contracts. I say, well, you know, some of my biggest, biggest customers, they, they just went short gold. Now, you know, now what are you going to do with that information, okay? Or I've got, you know, X number of guys that are, that are on the other side of that trade. I say, well, yeah, if you want to, you know, you want to take the other side of their trade, I mean, that's fine, fine with me. I'll put the order in. So it's like, you know, so he, he can put the order in, and then, you know, you've got to wait for, you've got to wait for a fill. I can't tell you how many times that I put orders in the market where there were limit orders because I didn't want to do a market order because I didn't want to get the slippage of a market order. So you do a limit order, and, and on a limit order, the market has to trade to be guaranteed to fill, the market has to trade through your price, does it not? How many times has the market traded to your price, okay, just right to your price if, on a buy order and reversed and you didn't get filled? That's very possible. The problem when you're doing it with a, with a, with a broker over the phone is that, is that that order goes into the pit. It goes to an executing, executing broker in the pit itself. So you've got a runner, and, 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 uh, and the order, you've got to go back to the runner, back to the phone bank, back to the broker, and the broker calls you with a fill. You're talking several minutes. Now, what if you're in a situation in a fast market where the market actually hit your price? You may have gotten filled, but you really don't know. You don't want to put a stop in the market because you don't even know if you're in or not. And the market's screaming, let's say, even in your favor, and you'd like to take profits, but you still haven't gotten your fill back yet. You don't even know if you're in the market. This is the kind of stuff we had to deal with all the time. All the time. It was a completely different world. Not only that, the only information that we had available to us was open, high, low, and close. That was it. Open, high, low, and close bars. And we used to have to get those unless we talked to our broker and pestered them, you know, X number of times a day. You know, you get it through the Wall Street Journal. We used to have to keep our own daily charts. Intraday stuff was just like non-existent. So, so anyway, I, you know, that's, I, I started trading like that. I went through, uh, 
Oh, I don't even remember what, what my first trading account was. I think it was around $20,000. You know, I lost all of that. And then, you know, saved up some money and opened up another one for around 15. You know, lost all of that. And then went to another broker. And I'm thinking this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And I'll find somebody who does. And, uh... And then this is, this is what really, really, this is probably the reason I'm even standing here today, was this particular trade, because, because this particular trade uh, just, it had a profound impact on me in terms, of, in terms of how it changed my life and what I was willing to do to find out what this was all about to find out really what does it take to be a consistently successful trader. What does it take to really be able to earn an income as a trader? I was, uh, I was, Long uh, Silver, this would have been back in, uh, right around 1980 or 1981, 1980 I think. I was long silver at around 975 an ounce. And there was two 5,000 ounce contracts at the uh, COMEX. In other words, I was long 10,000 ounces of silver at 975 an ounce. And right after I got into the market, the market dropped about 20 cents on me to about 9.55. So I was down $2,000. And my broker said, well, okay, you know, here's what we're going to do. Instead of getting out, we'll, we'll, we'll put you into a spread. And so what we'll do is we'll, you're long 10,000 ounces of silver in New York. We'll go short 10,000 ounces of silver in Chicago because you could trade Chicago silver at the Chicago Board of Trade. Are everybody with me on this? I just want to make sure that you guys are all with, you know, even though I know many of your stock traders, it's, uh, the concept is the same, okay? So I'm, I'm long. 10,000 at 975, he puts me short 10,000 at 955 in Chicago. So I've got this spread going on. And then he said, well, when the market goes back in your favor, we'll just take the short leg of the spread off. Now, keep in mind, back then, you guys are, you guys are what, do you, what do you typically pay for commissions, even in commodities? Or even, I don't know what you'd pay for stocks, but, but typically the average commission is about 4 to $5 a round turn, right? That's what you'd expect to pay? No, what are you paying? Less? More? Ten, Round ten turn? Oh, well, really? I, I got the well, you're in the Dow Mini. You're in the Dow Mini. What are you paying for the Dow, Dow Mini? Um, 11. 11? Oh, that's as low as I could. It started at like 30. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, then 11. Back in the day. Okay. Well, <laughs> back then, back in the 80s, we were, how much do you think we were paying back then? Come on. Give me a guess. Come on. Get What? Yeah, 125. How about, how's 125 around turn yeah. uh, per contract? Yeah. So in other words, me to put this trade on cost me 250 bucks. Okay. When he put this one on right here, it cost me another 250 bucks. And then he said, of course, that when the market goes back into my favor, he'll take the short leg of the spread off, and you know I should be all right. So that's exactly what the market did. The market went back up to, you know, right around the 975 area. He took the short leg of the spread off. And then the market immediately dropped back down another 20 cents and put the short, the short leg of the spread back on again. So that's another 250 bucks, okay? Plus, he just locked in. When he took this off, first of all, he locked in a $2,000 loss by putting this trade on. When the market went back up to 975 and he took this off, he locked in another $2,000 loss. And then when it went back down again, he put it, put it back on and locked in another $2,000 loss. Now I'm down $6,750. Okay? And then, of course, it, it happened two or three more times. Now, from, from, from the market's perspective, all I'm in, all the markets, the silver market's just in a trading range. That's all it is. It's just in a trading range. But, but I don't really, I didn't know how to read chart, chart patterns at the time. I didn't really understand what was going on. I was just listening to him. And so what he was doing was just taking advantage of the fact that he was going back and forth between support and resistance and, and generating commissions for himself, okay? That's, that was it. That's, that's basically, he was, just, he was just turning my account. But that's, that's not the story, okay? That's, that's happened to a lot of people. Of course, it happens less now because we're all responsible for the, the trades that we put on. All, all we have to do is click the mouse button, and, and it's not that much money. But here's, here's the story, is that... As these losses are as these losses are mounting, okay, and I can't I can't sleep and 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 getting real stressed out, you know, I, I wake up one morning and I thought, you know what, this is it. I just can't take this anymore. I just I just can't take it. 
And so, you know, when I got to work, I called them and I said, you know what, just get out of the whole damn thing. I, I just can't do this. So just liquidate the position. Does anybody remember the Hunt Brothers silver debacle? Oh, it didn't, it, 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 does anybody, if I say the word limit up, does anybody understand what I mean by that? Okay, the exchanges will impose artificial price limits of how much a commodity, or even a stock for that matter, can fluctuate in any given day before they stop trading. So we don't have, the, we don't have these kinds of moves too much anymore, but back in the 80s, limit moves were really quite common. They really were. In other words, what would happen is this, is that, is that if, the market, if the market went up, let's say, I think in silver it was 50 cents. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but if the market went up by 50 cents, they would actually stop trading, meaning if the market was bid up to, let's say, in this case, $10.25, trading would stop. In essence, what, that, what this means is that, is that, is that at 10.25, there were no people, there wasn't anybody in the world, there wasn't, now keep, keep this, this is important for later on, there wasn't one person in the world who was willing to sell silver at 1025, if it was a limit move. Not one person. And so what happens is that the market, the price will go up seeking to find who will actually sell. So what, and, but, what they, but what the exchanges didn't want is the exchanges didn't want there to be this, this huge fluctuation all in one day. There might have been sellers at 1026, or there might have been sellers at $11, but you don't know that because the exchange says we're going to stop trading at 1025. You guys with me on this? Okay. So what happened is that I don't think it happened more than maybe half an hour, 45 minutes after I got out. The market was trading right around 975 an ounce, where, where silver went limit up. And went limit up, was 30 days in a row to $49 an ounce? To forty nine dollars an ounce. I, I, I was looking now. Now keep now think now think about this. Okay, now think about being in this kind of a winning trade. Now, <clears throat> when we're in a winning trade, w the market almost never goes straight up and it never goes straight down. There are rare occasions, of course, like in this case, when it does. So that we're when we're in a winning trade, we have to constantly be making decisions about where we're going to take profits and how much heat we can take with the market coming back against our position to say, well, is this a time to take profits? Or am I going to let it come back a little bit further? Am I going to come back a little bit further against me? Because, well, is this, just a nor is this normal retracement or, or is this more significant, okay? Is this a little bit of a profit-taking retracement? Is it more significant? Should I get out now? Do we have more left? Is there, are we going to make new highs? You've got to be making all these kinds of decisions. And it's very difficult, as we all know, right? See, in this case, I didn't have to be making any decisions because the market went limit up 30 days in a row. Boom, boom. It was like, wake up, go ahead. Were you out or were you still I was out. I just got out like a half an hour before it happened. So you were just going, oh my God. Oh, see, the problem is I couldn't even get back in because there wasn't anybody willing to take the other side of the buy orders. On a limit move, you can't get back in. So I sat back and, and watched in complete agony. I mean, and I mean intense, intense agony. I don't, I don't, I didn't throw up, but you know, it's like eh, maybe I almost did. I don't know. Go ahead. You, you said you had five contracts. No, two, two. Just Why two. Why don't you just take one off the table, let the other one run for another day? First of all, Jerry, you're, you're assuming that I knew that this was going to happen. No, I'm assuming that getting out all at once takes you, off the, takes you out of the play completely. Jerry, have you ever been in a situation where you've really lost a ton of money and you just can't deal with it anymore? Yeah. Well, I, well, no, I I've been at. in a situation where I've been down a lot of money. Okay. I didn't lose because that's on paper. No, well, commodities, no. With stocks, you're right. With stocks, it's technically on paper. With, when, you're, when you're in commodities, the, the money's out of your account. It's gone. It's gone at the end of the day. Okay, it's not, this is not paper money. This is real money. Are, are you with me on this? Yeah, I am understanding you. Okay. So, so, so I wasn't looking at, at uh, I wasn't looking at, at, you know, at, like I said, paper losses. The money was out of my account. So I had had enough. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. So when you, when you think about it in that context, 
when you've just made up your mind that I just can't deal with this anymore, it doesn't even occur to you to get out in stages. Why would I get out in stages when, when, I, when I've already gone through a week and a half of this back and forth and, you know, uh, and it's virtually wiped out my account? Because by then, I probably would have had to put more money. If, even for me to take just one contract off and leave one on, I probably would have had to put more money in, in the account. And I'm not, there's not any point in doing that. Are you with me on this? I'm, I, do, I don't trade commodities. I trade other things. In, but the concept's the same. Except it doesn't come out of my, it's, as you said, it's a paper trade. Yeah, you already own, you own stock, you own an asset. I own And if you want to hold on to that asset until it goes down to zero, that's fine. Okay, your, money is not flowing. In a sense, money's flowing out of your account, but not in the same way it is with a commodity. No. Yeah. Okay, I have to pay that money right now. You're just losing the value of an asset. I actually have to pay mm. that money. And it comes out every single day. Go ahead. Go ahead and hand the microphone back to that gentleman. Well, another thing that can be uh, of interest here is, uh, at least from the way I gathered you was talking a while ago, you really weren't controlling this. Your broker was doing this. Correct. So even if you had wanted to get out in stages, your broker was doing it saying, hey, here's what I'm doing to you. In this case. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like I didn't really, I wasn't really in control of the situation because I didn't know what I was doing. All I know is that I was within, let's say, a half an hour, 45 minutes of, just, of a monster trade. A monster trade. And like I said, I, I sat back and watched in agony as the market went up to $49 an ounce. I'm thinking to myself, I was like that close to $400,000 on just two contracts. $400,000. And so, like I said, when I first started telling you this, this really had a profound impact on me. It really did. And I thought to myself, and at the time, I was managing a, a commercial casualty insurance agency in the suburbs of Detroit. Not really, you know, I thought that's what I wanted to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But, you know, I, I aspired to, to management. I was very successful. And, uh, you know, for, at the time, you know, even back then in, the, in you know, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, w was making a six-figure income, and I was only in, in my early 30s. So, you know, it was, I really had a lot of things going for me. But, uh, you know, after this experience, I thought to myself, you know what, i, I got to figure out what's going on here. And I certainly wasn't going to be able to do it in Michigan. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to Chicago. And that's what I did. I went to Chicago. The first I just thought, you know, if, if I'm going to get into the business, who am I going to get into the business with? Well, back then there was Merrill Lynch, there's Dean Witter, Smith Barney, you know, and I thought, well, you're gonna, who are you going to pick? You pick Merrill Lynch, right? Okay, so I went over the Chicago Board of Trade. They have an office right there and right on the second floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. And uh, they just so happened they had three openings uh, for trainee brokers and they had over a thousand people applying for it. So how am I gonna, how am I gonna be one of those three people? I thought, well, you know what? I went back, you know, I went back home. I went to, you know, one of, the, one of the bigger Merrill Lynch offices in the Detroit area, and I went through the whole employment, employment process to familiarize myself with what it is that they required to get a job. And, and, and this is what I think got me that job at the Board of Trade, is that they had an aptitude test, and this is a multi-page application, but on the back of the application, they had a, they had a square like this, on, you know, and, and they wanted spontaneously, while you're in the, you know, while you're filling this application out, spontaneously what they wanted you to do was to write like a little mini essay about some philosophical question. Before I went to the Board of Trade and actually filled out that application, I spent two weeks agonizing over every word. Just to make sure every word of that two or three paragraphs that I wrote down was completely perfect. So then when I took the app, I wrote down exactly what I'd worked on. And, and I can imagine why they hired me, because if you thought that I wrote that spontaneously in the moment, so hey, this guy, we got to have this guy here. We got to have this guy. Okay, so I did. I got the job. Now think about this. Now, when I was working for the agency, the casualty agency, commercial casualty insurance, I was, I, as a matter of fact, I just signed a contract, not more than like three or four months before I actually went to, the, went to work in, in Chicago, over a three-year period for $360,000. And what Merrill Lynch was offering me was $20,000 on a draw.
Okay. In other words, it was it was a you know they're going to give me twenty thousand, but it's a draw. I mean, I got to pay it back based on commissions. Now, there, if you can imagine, there wasn't one person in my life, not one person, who thought that I wasn't absolutely stark raving out of my mind to give that up to go to Chicago to do this. So you know, it wasn't like I had a lot of support. You know, and it wasn't like I wasn't catching a lot of grief from everybody that I knew about what it was that it, that I was doing. So you can imagine my horror, you might, is a good word for it. I mean, because when I got to Chicago, I'm thinking, why am I even doing this? I'm doing this because I'm going to Chicago because, because that's where the traders are. That's, that's where the people are who, who, know, who know what they're doing. Correct? And then to get there to find out that that is not the case. That is not the case at all. That the, there were 40, almost 50 brokers in the office. And none of them knew how to trade. And not only did they not know how to trade, I mean, they, Merrill Lynch made absolutely no bones about the fact that we were not traders. They spent no money, no time, and completely discouraged us from even learning how to trade. We were salesmen. We were taught how to talk about trading. We were taught how to talk about investments. We were taught how to, you know, it's called dialing for dollars, to get on the phone and get people to open up accounts. And, and, the, uh, and, and even though this was unspoken, I'd say the, the underlying philosophy behind the business was, especially in the commodities business, I'm not talking about the equities. I'm not saying that, that on the equity side of the business that, there, that it wasn't more reputable. But, but this was about as irreputable as it could be. Because the underlying philosophy that we operated from was, all commodity traders are terminal, meaning like they have a terminal Ill illness. It's only a matter of time before they want to say, all commodity traders are terminal, and it is our job as a broker to make them as comfortable as possible until they expire. <laughs> In other words, to extract as much money out of their account as you could until they're gone. And, 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 and even to this day, even to this day, it, it just blows me away to think that when I went, I went to a 30-day training class in Manhattan, and there were brokers from all over the world, probably about 80 or 90 of us, and, and the guy and, and the person that was the head of Merrill Lynch Commodities at the time, his name was John Conheny, and when he came in to address our class, and to this day, I don't know why he did this, but he, like he said, hi, and he started out, and he started out with these words, the average Merrill Lynch customer loses all their money in six months. And that was the truth. Uh, commodities, not equities, commodities. And that was the truth. That was about what it was. It's, it took about six months for people to lose their account, and, and, uh, and you just, like I said, you just go to the next one. So here, I'm, I, 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 I left this six-figure income to go to Chicago to learn about this business and this industry, and here I'm in a situation, and it's like, uh, it was, like I said, it was appalling, absolutely appalling. So I thought, well, okay, uh, I'll make friends with people on the floor. They must know what they're doing. The floor traders. The floor traders know what they're doing. Well, I found out that wasn't necessarily the case either. Now, it doesn't mean that the floor traders didn't know how to make money. But, but and this is, and I'm not going to get into this because we don't have time. But even though you, what you do is called trading, and what they do they call trading, the way and the mindset that you have to have to make money couldn't be further apart, even though they're both called trading. The typical local, when I mean the person who traded for their own account in the pit or in the floor of the exchange, the way they made money almost, they, didn't, they didn't, weren't trying to make direction-related decisions. In other words, it wasn't the kind of trading where they actually, they would find themselves in winning trades that were going in their favor, but that's not the reason why they put the trade on. And like I said, I'm not going to get into the, the, the specifics or dynamics of it because it would take me too long to explain. It just isn't necessary for right now. All I'm saying is that, is that it just, it, it's, it's a completely, as a matter of fact, before I, I left Chicago and moved to, um, to Arizona, uh, I, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange asked me, and I, and I worked on it for, for, oh, for a while, for about six months before I left, asked me to put together a program to help floor traders make the transition from the floor to screen-based trading because it's, it's, very, it's, it's a huge psychological leap. It really is. It's a huge transition that, that, that has to be made. 
So what I'm saying is that not knowing that before I got to Chicago, it was like here I'm in a situation where, where I really didn't know anybody who really knew how to trade, or at least knew how to trade in the sense of creating that consistency that we're looking for. It doesn't mean that people couldn't make money. People were making money all the time. It's just that, you know, what's the point of making money if you're, you're susceptible to giving it all back? In other words, if this is your equity curve, and then all of a sudden you're, 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 you're experiencing these huge losses and huge drawdowns, not only is this certainly damaging financially, but it's also damaging emotionally. And it, and it can be very difficult to recover from. These are what I call the boom and busters. Okay, you basically had traders that fall into three categories as far as equity curve is concerned. You've got your consistent winners, the people who have the traders, You've got your consistent winners. Now, that doesn't, now, it doesn't mean that there aren't drawdowns here, okay? But what do you think these drawdowns would be a reflection of for the consistent winners? Consistent winners take losing trades all the time. But their drawdowns are a reflection of what? Anybody got any ideas? Good uh, money management skills. Yeah, money, man money management skills. Capital preservation. Okay, these are okay. These are two good answers, but not the answer I'm looking for. Their drawdowns are simply a reflection of the normal losses that any trading methodology will incur. There are, there is such a thing as normal losses. You don't have to write this down because I'm just we're just starting to scratch the surface. We are going to go into this in far more detail later on. So, I mean, if you guys want to write it down, that's fine. But it, it really isn't necessary. Okay, normal losses that any trading methodology will incur. Then you've got people who, who, have, who, who learn something about how to trade, who acquire a good methodology where it is possible, based on that methodology, to experience consistent, a consistent income, but your equity curve might look more like this. Most people who are experienced the boom and bust cycles, these are the bust cycles, would say that something happened in the market to cause this. What you're going to find out today is that it is not the case. Even though it may seem like it, it is not the case. These are virtually always the result of trading errors, what I call trading errors, which we're going to go into in, in, in detail later on. One of the, oh, just, just, to, I, just for the gentlemen, the people, few people back here that don't have any idea of my background, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further in it, and, and just, I'm just going to jump ahead for a second. I ended up, ended up uh, being a trading coach. And, and, and working with, uh, I was a trading coach for probably about 17 years. I don't really do it, do it much anymore. I just pretty much focus on my own trading. But, but while I was, especially in the, you know, throughout the, the 80s and, and most of the 90s, um, I worked with a lot of floor traders. And um, one floor, we talk about boom and bust. There, there was one of the floor traders I worked with was probably one of the five biggest bond traders at the Chicago Board of Trade. And when I met him uh, was in like around May of 1992. And from January of 92 until the time that I met him in May of 1992, he had around, this is, no, this is a guy that just traded for himself. He didn't trade for a firm. He just traded his own account in, on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade in the bond pit. He had $12 million roll in and out of his account. And he had a particularly bad day and uh, he ran into somebody who attended one of my workshops and said, hey, you should go see this guy. He called me. We had a few appointments. Didn't really go anywhere. And the next thing, about a month later, I get a frantic call from his wife, who I hadn't even met. Didn't even know who she was. Got a frantic call from his wife that said, you know, they're going to lose their house if, you know, if, if uh, I don't do something with him, okay? <laughs> 
he, he had had a particularly, he had another bad, real bad day. So anyway, I started working with him in, in July of 1992. And from July of 1992 until the end of the year, he ended up the year with, with uh, almost $6, $6 million. Now, that may not seem like a lot considering he had these swings, but he'd never finished, he'd never finished a year with more than, I think, around seven hundred, six hundred fifty or $700,000. So he had just under $6 million. And so then he went on vacation. He happened to take a book with him called The Coming Collapse of the Bond Market. And this would have been uh, in like December of, or late December of 1992, early January of 93, and uh, came back. Now, if anybody remembers the bond market back then, it rallied to, it rallied to spectacular heights. But in the meantime, he'd read this, the coming collapse of the bond market, so he was going into the market every day short, okay? And, and, and pissing away the $6 million until he got to the point where he had about two of it left and, and took him about, I don't know, until maybe mid-February, and and he was so exasperated that he said, "Hey, you know what? I'm willing to do anything." Okay, now keep in mind, I'm willing to do anything, and he wasn't. It wasn't lip service. It was real. It was genuine. It was sincere. And I said, "If you're willing to do anything, then here's what you have to do." What I've been working with him. What I noticed is that he was able to stay focused really for not more than about an hour a day. Now, this guy loved trading. I mean, he just loved being in the pit. He just loved every part of it. He just, he just had the hardest time tearing himself away. But if he really wanted to make consistent money, then I, I felt that an hour a day was about it. Because after an hour a day, he'd start losing, his focus would start to diminish, and then he'd also start to get reckless. He was the kind of guy, and this, and this here again, this even kind of, this is very difficult for people to comprehend, but it is the absolute truth. He, he was the kind of guy where, when I was working with him during that period, in, you know, in, in, in the second half of 1992, where he would have a, um, he'd have a, a, a half million dollar day, winnings. He'd, he'd make a half million dollars. But when he called after he was out of the pit to, to have his consultation, you know, he'd be real angry with himself. Because he, up to about five minutes before the close, he was up a half a million dollars, and then he then he piss away about 175 of it. So it only ended up with 325 thousand dollars for the day. Now this is just like a normal guy, like like us here in this room, with 325 thousand dollars, and this was not an abnormal day. But he's real angry with himself because he pissed away that 175. And then the next day, you know, he'd do about the same thing. He'd make 400 and, and, and piss away maybe two at the close. And then the next day, he'd make, you know, 350 and then piss away another 150. He, he's got spectacular wins up until Friday. But this accumulated anger, anger that, that he was building up throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, by the time Friday rolled around, you know, he'd lose a million and a half bucks. And then start to the cycle all over again. So this, so now it's like I'm saying, you know what, especially as a floor trader, as a floor trader, you really have to be focused. When you're trading at the level that he traded at, where you're trading hundreds of sometimes thousands of contracts, if anybody knows anything about the bond market, we know that, that, that one incremental price change in a bond contract is $31.25, okay? You guys with me on this? So this would be a tick. So in other words, if the bonds went, went one, one tick up and you're long one contract, you'd make $31.25. If it went down one tick and you were long one contract, you just lost $31.25. He would trade 1,000 contracts at a time. That means one incremental tick price change was $31,000. Thirty-one thousand two hundred fifty bucks. Now, if anybody's ever watched the bonds move, you know that it can move five, ten, fifteen ticks like that. Not only that, there can be what's called price vacuums. Everybody familiar with the price vacuum? You know what I mean by price vacuum? It means that if if the bond is if the bonds are at uh, let's say one oh six uh, one oh six ten. Uh, you guys are probably not familiar with bond prices. 106.10, that was the last posted price. That something can happen, and you're long, 
something can happen where there are, there are no more offers and the next posted price is 106 even. That means the market went down 10 ticks without there being any trades between 10 and even. No trades at all. Which means if you're long, you just lost in that instant $31,000.25 on 1,000 on contracts. This is quite common. So you really have to be focused. It would be like when you're trading at this level, I, w I, would, I would make an analogy. It, it's almost like there's a couple of analogies. One, it's like if you're in an NBA playoff, it's the finals, it's the last game, seven games, it's, a, it's seven game NBA finals, one minute left, the score is tied. The coach is going to send somebody in who's really focused. If the coach thinks you're distracted and you're not on your game, you think you're going to get in that game? This is the way you, to be in these kind of circumstances in the pit, that's the kind of mindset that you had to maintain. Because even if you got, you just, even if you, were, if you were distracted and turned away, there could be bids and offers that would have gotten you out of your trade that all of a sudden dry up. Meaning when, when guys are bidding and offering in the pit, they're using hand signals. And they're, and they're telling you they want to buy or they want to sell and how many. And there's, there's hundreds of guys all around screaming. Now these bids and offers can dry up because when you have, make eye contact and you point, you say, okay, we've got a trade. And then you, you write your trade down in your trading card or now it's an electronic handheld, handheld device. But otherwise you make a trade and then you could be out of your trade and take your profits. When these kind of things happen, these price vacuums, you know, you're, you could be in bad shape. And just be a matter of just, just a momentary look away. The guy that you were going to use to get out of your trade is gone now. He put his hands down. Uh-oh, I'm, 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 in, I'm in trouble. Well, what I found is that, is that he could maintain his, an ideal mindset for about an hour a day. And so that's what I said. I said, you're really sincere. You, you, if you really, you really want to do, if you really do anything, you can only trade an hour a day. And he agreed to it. And he said, what hour a day? I said, doesn't, it really won't matter. And it really didn't. He was convinced initially that what hour he went in would make a big difference. It really didn't make any difference at all. He was so good. As a matter of fact, there were other bond traders that I work with that said that watching him trade would have been the equivalent of like watching Michael Jordan play basketball. He was that good. And so he did. He went in just one hour a day, and because he knew that he only had that one hour, he was really focused, and he was averaging $175,000 for that one day, or for that, on, on an average, for that one hour per day. Okay? But that would be an example. He would be an example of an extreme boom and buster. We get, kind of, if we're going to kind of have that concept down in the brain about boom and busters, okay? And then what you have is you have the consistent losers. People whose equity curve looks like that. Now, just to get back to uh, my situation, when I, when I, like I said, when I went to Chicago, I'm thinking, okay, you know, uh, I mean, I've got quite a bit of money. I, I, I sold my interest in the agency. But at the same time, uh, I had a uh, pretty expensive lifestyle, as you can quite imagine. I had, I had a house in, in Michigan that uh, uh, I had a girlfriend, a very high-maintenance girlfriend, and, and, and who, 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 her, her two daughters were living in. And I had a very expensive apartment in Chicago and a Porsche, and you know, I just I had the life, okay? And, uh, and you know, and I, was, I was going back and forth every weekend to visit them. Uh, so I mean, really my situation was I, I really, I, I couldn't maintain that kind of lifestyle with the money that I had without making, without being successful as a trader. And that was the whole idea anyway. I thought, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make whatever shortfall that, you know, I end up with as a trader. And interestingly enough, I had to have my trading account with another brokerage firm secretly. I couldn't trade through Merrill Lynch. And there wasn't anybody else in the office who, who traded their own money. I was the only, unless they were doing it secretly and didn't tell me. I was the only person in the office who, who was actually trading their own money. 
Who actually traded, period, other than putting on trades for their customers? So what ended up happening is that, and oh, another, another part of this is that, is that I also had this, um, I just, I, I, don't, and I can't really tell you why I knew this, it's just that I did. I just, it just made sense to me. It, it just never occurred to me that trading was anything other than about psychology. I mean, the first trading book I ever bought was, was the, actually the very, very first book on trading, the, only, the first book that was devoted uh, uh, specifically to trading psychology, which was Jake Bernstein's Investor's Quotient that came out in 1980. And there weren't that many trading books avail even available back then. And that was the first trading book that I, I didn't buy a book on technical analysis. I bought a book on trading psychology. So I was, I was not only Im immersed in the concepts of trading psychology virtually right from the very beginning, I was also keeping very extensive journals of, of my thinking process, what was going on, what I was observing from uh, other brokers in the, you know, in the uh, Merrill Lynch office, as well as what I was observing from uh, m interacting with my customers. And I noticed we were all kind of, all kind of, you know, conforming to the same patterns, the same problems. But just say that because I, I did have, you know, I did have this kind of foundation you know, to understand that, that it was basically psychological in nature. Because one of the things we're going to talk about, you know, when I get into the skill section of, of this, of the presentation, is that when you look at trading skills, it's like, well, what kind of skills are we talking about? If we're talking about thinking like a professional, we're implying that the skills are all mental in nature, and they are. Because when you really get right down to it, and you really start to think about it, what physical skills are necessary to, to trade? We're not talking about a golf swing or a tennis racket or any other kind of, you know, any other kind of physical endeavor that, that, we're, we're, that we're familiar with. What kind of skills we, what does it take physically to put on a trade? A mouse click. A mouse click, that's it. Your ability to move the mouse and click it on the buy or sell button. It's that simple. And as a result of it being that simple, it's easy to think that, oh my God, trading is so easy. It isn't. As you well probably know, whether you've been at it a long time or even a little bit of time, there are some very sophisticated psychological skills that you have to acquire to get this kind of an equity curve. And, and virtually all these skills are founded in learning how to trade without fear. That's basically what this whole workshop's about, is learning how to trade without fear. Because that's what's going to screw you up on virtually everything. Everything that you can do wrong as a trader is going to be the result of what you're afraid of and the effects that fear has on your perception of market information. So... So with my situation, it's like here I'd given all this up to go to Chicago to learn how to trade, to find out that the only people who really knew how to trade back then were, were people that I didn't have access to, meaning there were, there were, you know, there were some big names in the industry who never really took the time or expended the effort to find out exactly what it is that allowed them to create a consistently rising equity curve, what they would say is, well, yeah, you got to go with the flow. The trend is your friend. Cut your losses. Let your profits run. You know, it was all these, all these neat little phrases, but it's like, who in the hell knew what that meant and how to do it? Yeah, it sounds great. Cut your losses. Let your profits run. Oh, you know. Even cutting your losses is, can be extremely difficult to learn. Letting your profits run can be 10 times more difficult than learning how to cut your, profit, cut, cut your losses. In fact, it's one of the most difficult things to, to acquire in terms of a skill is learning how to let your profits run. So it was like all this was kind of building up, and my lifestyle was, was, draining, was draining my money away. 
and one of the things that one of the things that that I would say characterized me back then if I was probably obsessive about anything it was my credit it's like my credit was my as far as I was concerned it was like the most important thing in life is to have flawless flawless credit not just I mean flawless and here I'm in a situation where I'm, I am truly running out of money. And my trading losses, I didn't really, it wasn't really like I was losing a lot of money trading because I'd really stopped the hemorrhaging. I wasn't trading in a way where I was actually losing money. But I wasn't making any money. And it's like there was always this little voice in the back of my brain, you know, would come to the forefront of my consciousness and it would say, you know, Mark, this ain't adding up. There's something wrong here. There's, some, there's something wrong. It's like it's not, it's not adding up. And then I kind of shove it back there and, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be all right. I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. It's going to be all right. Eventually it got to the point where I, I, I was literally out of money. And the only choice I had was to file bankruptcy. Fortunately, I was in a situation where I had two residences, one in Chicago and one in Michigan. And so I had a choice of where I filed. And of course, I filed in Michigan because if Merrill Lynch would have found out, they probably would have fired me. As a matter of fact, nobody knew what had happened. I, nobody knew in Chicago, nobody that I knew in Chicago knew what had happened. So I filed in Michigan. And I'm thinking, and literally, because of my attitudes about credit, I'm thinking, if I've got to do this, I'm going to fall beneath the cracks of society and never reemerge. I really believe that. I honestly, God really did. I just didn't see how it was possible to live. After having, have to, after having to do something like that. And of course, you know, what I found is that, and what I ended up, I mean, what I say in The Disciplined Trader, and I don't really go into a lot of detail in The Disciplined Trader about this, but just, just to say that what I ended up with was really, I, I had an apartment, I, I had my bed and my TV, and, 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 and when, I, when I filed, I was still current on everything. I wasn't even late one day on any of my bills. As a matter of fact, I even, I even called you know, called the, the, the finance company to come and pick the car up. But I wasn't even late a payment. I said, you know what, I can't do it anymore. You're probably going to want it back anyway. So, you know, it was like, come and pick it up. And, of course, they did. And, and, uh, and the, the, you guys, well, there's a funny story about that. I've never, I've never told anybody this, but you guys want to hear a funny story about that? When the guy came to pick it up. And uh, so I'm thinking, you know, because we we're, we're in front of the apartment building and, and I'm thinking, well, if he's going to pick this up, you know, then I ought to get some sort of receipt that it was in perfect condition. You know, because I don't know what the hell he's going to do to it on, on you know, I, I mean, I don't know. So it's like, and the guy wouldn't give me a receipt saying that. And so I wouldn't give him the keys. And so, you know, so he called his boss and, and, I, and, I, heard, and I heard his boss on the other end of the line screaming at him. You do whatever he wants to get those keys, you know. Just like, and I, he said something else. I'm not going to say uh, for this, for the, for this, you know, for, for this particular presentation. But yeah, it was like, you know, they just, uh, you know, someone's someone's willing to give you the car. They don't even have to go repossess it. It's like, you know, hey, give them the receipt. But in any case, uh, what I realized. I mean, now, you think about this. It's like, it's like when you define yourself based on your possessions. You know, just like anybody that loses anything, you, you know, you, you've, got, you've got an internal representation and you've got an external representation. And now there was, there was a, uh, a discrepancy between what was outside of me and what was inside of me in terms of the way that I define myself. And, you know, so that has to be reconciled. And what I realized, you know, and it, it didn't even really take that long. I don't remember how long it took, but it was like, one, I still had my job at Merrill Lynch. And so... As a result, I mean, it's like I'm starting thinking, okay, well, things are going to be all right. I was in my worst fear. I mean, that was my worst fear. I mean, when the, when the fear would creep up into the forefront of my mind, I was like, the, you know, that was my worst fear. Now I'm in it, and I'm realizing that, you know, I think I'm going to be all right. I, I'm healthy. I can still think. I'm going, to, I'm going to be all right. And when I came to this realization that I'm going to be all right, this is when things change for me as a trader. And, and, this is, and this is the interesting part about my situation that, that most people don't have the benefit of experiencing. There are two things. One, I had this foundation of knowing that it was all psychological anyway. So I had all these things that, I, that I'd been working on up to that point. And two, when you tap out as a trader, I mean when you really tap out, you don't get to trade anymore because you don't have any money. 
right? But I was in a situation where I still got to trade. Even though I was working with other people's money, I still got to trade every day. And so as a result of experiencing my worst fears, coming to the realization that I'm going to be all right, and then at the same time being, being in a position where I'm able to interact with the market, it was like because I didn't have anything more to lose, I didn't. It was like, it was like this, the market completely changed for me. It was like I had these blinders on that all of a sudden just came off because the market was different because I wasn't afraid anymore. I was seeing the same patterns over and over and over again beforehand, but I was seeing the same patterns differently. I was seeing the same patterns from a, let's say, relatively carefree state of mind. And that relatively carefree state of mind allowed me to like to say, flow in and out of my trades with an ease and effortlessness that I would not have been able to imagine beforehand. And then what happened is that I started making consistent money for my customers. And there's even, well, uh, i there's, there's one, one really, as a matter of one really good, good story where, I mean, there, there are a lot of good stories that I can tell you about my customers at Merrill Lynch. But in one case, uh, I inherited this guy who, was, who at the time was the head of the state of Illinois' uh, mainframe computers, and he was from India. And he had put together his own trading program, and he was using the you know, state computers to do it. And so, uh, and, and he had an account, technically an account with Merrill Lynch, but wasn't funded because he'd lost all his money. But he, but he still had, he still maintained the account. And so I inherited him as a customer and he would call me every day. And he was just like, and all he would say to me is like, I'd pick up the phone. He wouldn't say, hi, how are you? He'd say, give me data. You know, like give me the high, low and close. And, you know, so we interacted like this for a long time. Well, he came up with his own day trading system that, uh, that, that eventually, well, because he and I started working on it together. He had, the, he had the internal program for it, but he didn't have any money management parameters for it. So after about two or three months of working with him on it, we came up with some really good money management parameters. And then all my customers started trading it, and, and we were making consistent money day after day, even to the point where Merrill Lynch was starting to take notice. You know, that, that you know, here all, all this whole customer, his, his customer base is, is making money. And, and he got to the point where, where he's thinking, okay, all these people are now deriving this benefit from my work. I should be able to do it too. And he talked his wife into letting him put $5,000 into his account to fund his account. Now, I don't know what happened to him. Why? I mean, I, you know, it's not like we had personal discussions. So I don't know why he didn't have any money in his account. The guy was a maniac. It's like he, got, he, put the, he put the money in his account, and two days later, it was all gone. It was like he called me up and say, okay, do this. I said, well, wait a second. The, the system says to do this. Said, no, 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 no. I don't care what the system says. This is what's going to happen. He didn't follow any of his own rules. Now, here we had a track record. We had a legitimate track record, bona fide, real money. Day after day, he gets a few bucks in his account, and it's like he thinks he knows where the market's going. Like I said, he, he was gone in two days, and that was it. It was all over with, because at that point, he, he, you know, he was done. I didn't get the system because it was in, in his computer, mainframe computer at the state of Illinois and, and had no more contact with him. And shortly after that, ended up getting fired from Merrill Lynch anyway because there was a, like one of these management consultants that came in from New York and she was going around the office talking to all the different brokers because of whatever, whatever, whatever it was that they were trying to find out. And she got to me and at that, by that time, I was already writing the discipline trader. And so, and I just like, you know, I started very exciting to say, oh yeah, this is what I found out and this is what I've learned. And her eyes lit up saying, this is exactly, this is exactly what we're looking for. And she was just, we talked for probably about an hour, hour and a half and she, she was all excited. And then she, and then she said, I, you know, I got to go tell, well, I don't know how to say his name, the, the office manager, okay? And she walked away from me, walked over to the office manager. 10 minutes later, 10 minutes later, he came over and said, pack up your stuff and get out. 
right then and there, right then and there on the spot. Pack up your stuff and get out. So that's how I ended up, uh, uh, ended up actually being a trading coach because by then, uh, just, you know, floor trade, because I'd made friends with floor traders, you know, I was making friends to find out how they trade and that sort of thing. Well, they started coming to me for advice, even while I was at Merrill Lynch. And, uh, and because it's a pretty small community, uh, you know, the word gets around, especially when, when you, you know, people are really genuinely helped with, with the kind of advice that you're, the, that you're giving them. And I'd, you know, and I'd help several floor traders turn their trading around. And so what had happened is I started getting hired by uh, clearing firms. What I mean by clearing firms is that to trade on the floor of an exchange, you have to, uh, you have to clear your trades through a financial institution. And so, you know, it's like you're, it's, it, these are traders just like you. They have their own account, but, but what they have to do is they have to clear their trades through, like I said, one of the, one of the major clearing firms at the exchange. Well, what, it hap what would happen is this, that it isn't like this now, but back in the, back in the early 80s, or the mid 80s, clearing firms were in some ways like, like almost like family operations where, where the people who owned the clearing firms, they knew all the, all the floor traders, they were friends with them, they partied together, you know, Christmases and holidays and that sort of thing. And so if one of the floor traders would go debit, you know what I mean by go debit? In other words, you know, you have to trade, have to have a, a positive, a positive balance in your account. Well, the problem with floor trading is that not, again, not today, but back then, when you traded on the floor, you had, to, you had to record your trades on a trading card. So in other words, if you and I are entering into a trade where I'm going long and you're going short, what I would do is, is that we would, we would take our badge, like a, the acronym of our badge, and, and our clearinghouse number, record it on this card, and how many contracts we traded. Let's say you're short 10 and I'm long 10, and the price that, that, that we traded them at. Well, those cards didn't have to be turned in until the end of the day. And then they'd all get reconciled, meaning that between all the different trades and all the, all the traders from all the different clearing firms, this would all go into a central clearing operation to find out which trades were, you know, to find out who's long and who's short, how much money's coming out of whose account, and whether or not they were called, what are called out trades, meaning that you thought, you thought I said 10, and, and I thought we were doing it for 100. Okay, so now we've got a discrepancy of 90 trades. These were called out trades that had to be reconciled before the open of the next day, which is a whole nother world. We're not, we're not, we're not going to get into it. All, but all I'm saying is that, all I'm saying is that, is that it would not be unusual for guys to overtrade during the day, and the clearing firm wouldn't even find out about it until the end of the day. For an example, one of the one of the guys I worked with at Merrill Lynch, eventually he was a mathematics professor, a really nice guy, should not have been a trader at all. Had absolutely, I mean. Anyway, rhythm peas at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and he was a one-lot trader, meaning you know just traded one contract, one in and out, one contract, and and and, and eventually the forces inside of him were building up where he's frustrated with the fact that he's you know he can't make a living at it, he's just eking eking it out, where one day he snapped, and this and this one-lot trader almost took down the clearing firm. In other words, he's got like several thousand S and P's on several thousand contracts where other guys are into those trades and, and the market's going against them. So he almost took down a clearing firm just, just by himself. So what would happen is that, is that because guys would go debit, meaning they end up in the day lost, maybe they're down 25000 or fifty or $100,000, the guy that owns the clearing firm doesn't want to say, hey, you can't trade until you pay this off. They'd want to let him to go back into the pit to work it to work it down. Well, after you know you got four or five of these troublesome or fifteen of these troublesome traders that are constantly running debits, you start to get a little worried. And so what they did is start they they, they hired me to work with these guys. Most of the information, most of the insight, let's say that that you'll find in the disciplined trader and trading in the zone came from me working with these floor traders on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I'm laughing because obviously it was quite a, it was quite a trip <laughs> working with these guys because they, they are not like, they are not like you and me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really about the best I can, the best way I can describe it without going into a lot of detail. They're not like you and me. So anyway, I, you know, this is kind of a, a maybe a long drawn out 
introduction to the fact that what we're talking about here is that you guys have a, a really wonderful trading methodology where there is an enormous amount of potential for you to be able to make a consistent income from being able to take full advantage of the potential that this trading methodology offers you. But I would say that there's probably, it wouldn't be unfair for me to say It wouldn't be unfair for me to say that there's probably what I'm going to call the profit gap. The gap between the potential and your bottom line results. This is the potential and this is your bottom line results. Most people think that when they realize that this gap exists, that somehow learning more about the markets is what's going to fill it. And what you're here today to learn is that that is categorically not the case. You have to learn more about yourself and how you interact with your trading platform and the market to be able to fill this gap. There are psychological skills involved. And when I talk about psychological skills, we, we, let, let, let's, do, do anybody think of an example of a psychological skill? This, this, this is difficult. I don't think, you know, I'm not saying that you should have the answer, but can you think of an analogy in, you know, in maybe in other parts of the way we express ourselves that you can think of what would be an example of a psychological skill? Anger management. Anger management? Okay, that, good. Anybody else? Okay. What about a situation? And I was just, anybody watch Wimbledon here lately? Just it was on? I'm, I'm not a big tennis fan, but I just happened to be watching it. And because I knew that this, I was doing this, this workshop here, this is something that really sticks in my mind. What's the difference between, between let's say, oh, here, this is even a better example. What's the difference between a, bas a pro basketball player who can stand at the free throw line and hit 20 in a row, even 30 in a row, where the thing about the variables are fixed. The line and the basket and the distances, they're all fixed. And they've got the motor skills to be able to hit, like I said, 10, 15, 20 in a row. But they get into a situation where there's one second left and the score is tied and this basket is going to win the game and he chokes. That's a cycle. The guy that doesn't choke has a psychological skill that the other one doesn't. Trading without fear is a psychological skill. It is a skill that the professionals have acquired and that they have evolved beyond the typical mindset or the kind of mindset that the typical trader operates out of. So when we're talking about trading or thinking like a pro, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that you will evolve beyond the typical mindset so that you can take full advantage, full advantage, this represents, if this line represents potential, that you can take the potential of your methodology, so that you can take full advantage of your methodology. Because it has to do with your state of mind. So guys, this is the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and share with your friends. And if you are already not subscribed, Please subscribe to the channel. Thank you again.